Chapter 15 War Made a Prophet Prepare against them whatever arms and cavalry you can muster, that you may strike terror in the enemies of Allah. Allah desires killing them to manifest the religion. Coveting what belongs to others, Muhammad gave us another glimpse into his soul. Tabari When the prophet came to Yathrib, he saw the Jews fasting on Ashura day. He questioned them, and they told him that it was the day upon which God drowned Pharaoh and saved Moses from the Egyptians. He said, We have a better right to Moses than you do. He fasted and ordered his fellow Muslims to fast with him. When the fast of Ramadan was prescribed, he made Ashura optional. The Bible's messianic message, past, present, and future, revolves around the seven festivals of Yahweh. When they pretend Messiah asked the Jews why they were fasting, Muhammad proved he was a phony. What's more, he got it wrong. There is only one fast on the Jewish religious calendar, Yom Kippur, known as the Day of Atonement. But it's celebrated in the fall, and it has nothing to do with Pharaoh. The spring feast of Passover commemorates freedom from Egyptian bondage, and it took the Jews more like six days, not six months, to elude his army. As an interesting aside, in 1978, Ron Wyatt discovered Pharaoh's graveyard in the Gulf of Aqaba branch of the Red Sea, proving once again that the Bible's chronology was accurate. Moreover, when Mohammed said that he had a better right to Moses than did the Jews, his counterfeit religion became as obvious as a pink six-dollar bill with a turbaned president. Needing to corrupt all things biblical to please his dark spirit, Muhammad told his fellow terrorists that they should take a break from raiding civilians. But it wouldn't last. Stealing a ritual was insufficient, even if it were a pagan one. Muhammad needed to own everything the Jews possessed and held sacred. In actuality, both Ashura and Ramadan honor false gods. The spring fast being erroneously observed was crying for Tammuz, the legacy of Jewish captivity. It also honors the Babylonian sun god. Catholic Lent is derived from the same rite. And Mohammed reestablished the pagan Tananuth fasts of Ramadan, saying that they commemorated his wrestling match with the cave spirit. Returning to Mohammed's scheme, Tabari. In this year, Muhammad ordered the people to pay the zakat tax. It is said that the Prophet commanded them to do this. Allah and Muhammad spoke with one voice. Paying the zakat became an order and then a pillar. The political manifesto was ushered in with these words. Ishak, when the apostle was settled in Medina and his comrades were gathered to him, the affairs of the workers were arranged and Islam became firmly established. Prayer was instituted. The prostration was the sign of his power. The zakat tax was prescribed. Dictators thrive on money. Legal punishments were fixed, as were all things permitted and forbidden. As a confirmation of the tyrant's supreme authority. A benevolent dictator, however, Muhammad was not. Ishak. When Allah's apostle came to Medina, it was the most fever-infested place on earth. It smote Muslims to such a degree that they could only pray sitting. Muhammad came out when they were praying thus and said, Know that the prostration of the sitter is only half as valuable as that of the stander. The Muslims painfully struggled to their feet, despite their weakness, seeking a blessing. This pathetic statement was followed by, then the apostle prepared for war in pursuance of Allah's command to fight his enemies and to fight the infidels who Allah commanded him to fight. Fighting was such an essential part of Islam's formation that Tabari devoted the next sixty pages to a single conflict, the Battle of Badar, known as the Fight of the Full Moon. It takes five times more attention than Abraham's pilgrimage to the Kaaba, the establishment of Islam. It gets ten times more ink than the first revelation, Muhammad's call to the prophethood. It garners twenty times more coverage than Muhammad's migration to Yathrib, the hijra that instigated the Islamic era. How is it that a battle became the centerpiece of a religion?
The initial salvo of the battle to resurrect Islam nearly crucified it. We are told that Muhammad led his militants on a terrorist raid designed to rob another caravan in, of all months, Ramadan. Tabari. In this year, the great battle of Badar took place between the Messenger of Allah and the Quraysh unbelievers in the month of Ramadan. Since fasting was required in the sacred month, since the observance of Ramadan was a religious obligation, a pillar of Islam, why were the first Muslims and their prophet on the prowl during their most holy time? Do you suppose money was more important than piety? At Badar, Muhammad was the aggressor, just as he was on 73 of his 75 terrorist raids. The prophet got to choose the time, the place, and the victim. He also elected to terrorize money-laden civilians during Ramadan. Reason would thus dictate that the prophet had discarded his original calling and become a pirate. As you contemplate what motivated Islam's bad boy, consider this. Tabari, Abd al-Rahman said, Muhammad celebrated the night of 17 Ramadan. In the morning, traces of sleeplessness would be on his face. He would say, On this morning, Allah distinguished between truth and falsehood, revealing the Quran. On this morning, he made Islam mighty, humbling the leaders of unbelief at Badar. Submission was made mighty because the Quraysh were humbled. Allah distinguished between truth and falsehood by having Muslim militants murder Meccan merchants. But violence isn't cheap. Like today's terrorists, the first Muslims needed money. Tabari and Ishak. The apostle heard that Abu Sufyan, a Meccan merchant, was coming from Syria with a large Quraysh caravan containing their money and their merchandise. He was accompanied by only 30 men. The Meccans were going about their lives, working to make a living, something Muslims were unwilling to do. So Islam was about to rob them. This was after fighting had broken out between them, and the people had been killed and taken captive at Nakla. If you were reading this out of context, you might assume that these parties were in a state of war, and that both were to blame for escalating hostilities. But you know better, because the Islamic Hadith has shown that only the Muslims were militants. They had set out on a dozen terrorist raids, they had ventured out as far as 200 miles to rob Meccan civilians. They were the sole perpetrators. Having killed the Meccan Hadrami in cold blood, they kidnapped his companions and held them for ransom. Ever inclined to put the best possible spin on their violent beginnings, the first Muslims claimed, Tabari, this incident had provoked a state of war between the Prophet and the Quraysh, and was the beginning of the fighting in which they inflicted casualties upon one another. In other words, before the Islamic raid, there was no fighting. Not a single Muslim had been killed. In fact, there were no armies. The Muslims had raiders, terrorists in our parlance. The Meccans had merchants, businessmen in today's vernacular. But if pirates are shady entrepreneurs, Muhammad was a businessman par excellence. Ishak, Allah divided the booty stolen from the first caravan after he made spoils permissible. He gave four-fifths to those he had allowed to take it, and one-fifth to his apostle. Not one to miss another opportunity. Ishak, Muhammad summoned the Muslims and said, This is the Quraysh caravan containing their property. Go out and attack it. Perhaps Allah will give it to us as prey. These lines forever damn Islam's pretense of religiosity. They bear repeating. This is the Quraysh caravan containing their property. Go out and attack it. Perhaps Allah will give it to us as prey. The motivation was piracy, not religion. The historian reports, Tabari, 
Abu Sufyan and the horsemen of the Quraysh were returning from Syria following the coastal road. When Allah's apostle heard about them, he called his companions together and told them of the wealth they had with them and the fewness of their numbers. The Muslims set out with no other object than Sufyan and the men with him. They did not think that this raid would be anything other than easy booty. These armed raiders wanted to steal assets and kidnap folks. Since the Prophet's sole motivation was piracy, not piety, Islam cannot be a religion. And if it is, we need to canonize Blackbeard and call him a prophet. The fact that the first adherents of this perverse doctrine record this stunning admission of guilt reminds me of the Nazis and the way they chronicled their atrocities in World War II. Immoral, hateful, and violent doctrines like Islam and Nazism corrode men's minds and consciences to the point they become unable to differentiate right from wrong. Ridding the world of those they view as inferior, stealing their possessions, becomes part of their mission, and thus becomes good, deeds worthy of heroic lore and scripture. As further proof that the Badar raid was an act of terrorism, another hadith reports. Bukhari Allah did not admonish anyone who had not participated in the Ghazwa raid of Badar, for in fact Allah's apostle had only gone out in search of the Quraysh caravan so that he could rob it. But Allah arranged for the Muslims and their enemy to meet by surprise. I was at the Aqaba pledge with Allah's apostle when we gave our lives in submission. But the Badar battle is more popular amongst the people. I was never stronger or wealthier than I was when I followed the prophet on a Goswa. That pretty much sums up Islam. Upon hearing that Muhammad was on the prowl, the Quraysh sent a delegation out to protect their people and business assets. This explains why the Quran says that Muslims were contemplating a choice between easy booty and fighting for doctrinal supremacy. They did not suppose that there would be a great battle. Concerning this, Allah revealed the Quran, and you long that other than the armed one might be yours. This became Quran 8-7. Before I comment, I'd like you to have the benefit of the entire verse. Quran 8, verse 7. Behold, Allah promised you that one of the two parties would be yours. You wished for the unarmed one. But Allah willed to justify his truth according to his words, and to cut off the roots of the unbelievers. To cut off the roots is to kill. That makes Allah a murderer and Muhammad a pirate. One was after booty, the other blood. It was worse than that. They inspired a gang of armed men to attack a defenseless civilian enterprise, one owned by a rival. As such, they were terrorists. And there is no way to discount the source of this condemning scripture, as it's confirmed in all three Hadith collections and in the Quran. The Traditions Report Ishak, the people answered the Prophet's summons, some eagerly, some reluctantly. Tabari, when Abu Sufyan heard that Muhammad's companions were on their way to intercept his caravan, he sent a message to the Quraysh. Muhammad is going to intercept our caravan. So protect your merchandise. When the Quraysh heard this, the people of Mecca hastened to defend their property and protect their men, as they were told Muhammad was lying in wait for them. The Sira suggests that they weren't quite so hasty. Ishak, some of the Meccans got up to circumambulate the Kaaba. Sitting around the mosque, they wondered why they had allowed this evil rascal to attack their men. The pagans were being religious, worshipping Allah in his mosque. The Muslims had abandoned religion, setting out on a terrorist raid in the holy month of Ramadan. Ishak, setting out in Ramadan, Muhammad was preceded by two black flags. His companions had seventy camels on which men rode in turns. It's interesting. The white battle flags of the Maghazi raids inspired by Muhammad turned black when the prophet personally led the parade. Tabari, I have been informed by authorities that Muhammad set out on three Ramadan at the head of three hundred and ten of his companions. The emigrants on the day of Badar were seventy-seven men, and the Ansar were two hundred and thirty-six. 
The war banner of the messenger was carried by Ali. The banner of the Ansar was carried by Saad. Back in Kabaville. Tabadi. A body of Meccan men was drawn from the clans. Neither the prophet nor his companions heard about this force until they reached Badar, which was on the coastal route the Quraysh caravan had taken from Syria. These passages confirm that Muhammad was on the prowl. They reveal that the caravan was comprised of a poorly protected assemblage of businessmen. They suggest that when Sufyan sent for help, it came in the form of townsfolk. There was no standing army. Mecca was a tiny village of some 5,000 traders eking out a humble living. They didn't have a police force, much less a military. Before Muhammad and Islam, they hadn't needed one. Ishak and Tabari The Prophet marched forward and spent the night near Badar with his companions. They did not know that the Quraysh had come out against them. When the Prophet was standing in prayer, asking Allah to help him steal, some Quraysh water carriers came to the well. Among these was a black slave. Muhammad's men seized him and brought him to the messenger's bivouac. They ordered him to salute Allah's apostle. Then they questioned him about Abu Sufyan, having no idea that he was not from the caravan. When the slave began to tell them about the protecting force, it was unwelcome news, for the only object of their raid was Abu Sufyan and the booty from his caravan. Picture the scene. The founder of a religion is out on a terrorist mission designed to raid a civilian business. He is praying, asking his spirit to help him kidnap innocent people and steal their possessions. His fellow militants capture a slave, and they torture him, trying to solicit information. To body. Meanwhile, the prophet was praying, bowing and prostrating himself, and also seeing and hearing the treatment of the slave. When the slave told them that the Quraysh had come to meet them, they began to beat him and called him a liar. You are trying to conceal the whereabouts of Abu Sufyan and his caravan. They beat him severely and continued to interrogate him, but they found out that he had no knowledge of what they were looking for. I have said that Muhammad was the most vile and immoral man ever to have walked the earth. The first Muslims agree, although their hearts and minds have been corroded by Islam, so they don't seem to care. They think that they are just describing another day at the prophetic office. For such immoral and barbaric acts to have been passed on as traditions and linked to the Quran, Muslims must view these terrorist raids and the ensuing crimes favorably. They must see such ungodly behavior as a living witness of Allah's cause, an example as to how to be a good Muslim. Tabari, when the slave said, I am from the Quraysh who have come out against you, they beat him. But when he said, I am with Abu Sufyan, they left him alone. When the Prophet saw what they were doing, he stopped his prayer. He said, By him in whose hand my soul rests, you beat him when he tells the truth and leave him alone when he lies. Muhammad wasn't bothered by Muslims beating the black slave, just by their inept interrogation technique. And he was nervous. Mercenaries can be an unruly lot. Ishak. The apostle was afraid the Ansar would not feel obliged to help him fight without the enemy being the aggressor and attacking in Medina. This is further evidence. Muhammad wasn't defending Muslims in Islam. As proof he wasn't a prophet, the Ansar surprised him. Saad said, We hear and obey. We are experienced in war, trustworthy in combat. Allah will let us show you something that will bring you joy. The apostle was delighted at Saad's words, which greatly encouraged him. Muhammad shouted, It is as if I see the enemy lying prostrate. The founder of Islam was pleased by the prospect of war and was encouraged by the thought of his foe bowing in submission. That's fine if you're Stalin, Mao, or Hitler. It's bad if you're Mohammed. The Sira speaks of another interrogation. Ishak, a young man, was brought to the apostle and beaten. When the Muslims were displeased with his answers, they beat him soundly. Watching the interrogation while performing two prostrations, the prophet interrupted the proceedings and said, Mecca has thrown us pieces of its liver. But alas, the attended target escaped the raider's grasp. Ishak, 
Abu Sufyan changed the caravan's direction from the shore road, traveling as quickly as possible. Ishak, when the Sufyan, when Sufyan saw that he had saved his caravan, he sent word to the Quraysh, Since you came out to save your caravan, your men and property, go back home. Some of the militant militia left, but... Abu Jal said, Badar was the site of an Arab fair. We are going to spend a few days, slaughter camels, feast, drink wine, and have some girls play for us. The non-partier said, We came out to protect our property and defend our men. There is no point of staying to fight, so they returned to Mecca. On the Muslim front, we discover that Muhammad wasn't much of a general. We are told that a man named Hubbub asked him, Ishak, did Allah order you to occupy this place so that we have no choice, or was this position chosen as a matter of opinion for military tactics? When Muhammad said that Allah had not spoken to him about it, the Ansar chief saved the day and ruined the world. This is not the proper place, Hubbub said. We should go to the well nearest the enemy, stop up all the other wells, and deprive them of water. Then Saad say, Prophet, let us build you a booth of palm fronds from which you can watch the battle safely. The apostle thanked and blessed them. So let the battle begin. Tabari. When the Quraysh advanced, Muhammad threw dust in the direction of their faces, and Allah put them to flight. The Meccan merchant force and the prophets pirates met and Allah gave victory to his messenger, shamed the unbelievers, and satisfied the Muslims' thirst for revenge on them. To think that these delusional and immoral boys started a religion is beyond belief. Ishak, when the apostle saw them, he cried, Allah, they called me a liar. Destroy them this morning. Jeremiah, he was not. The Meccans, however, were civilized. Ishak, Utba rose to speak. Let us turn back and leave Muhammad to the rest of the Arabs. If we fall upon him, we will be hunted for having slain the son or brother of our kin. Tabari, the prophet said to his companions, You are the same number as the people of Saul on the day he met Goliath. Actually, Saul and his men were far more numerous, and they refused to fight the Philistines, which is why David was given the opportunity to sling himself into immortality. Had Mohammed been a real prophet, he never would have quoted this story. Had he had any faith, he would have followed David's example. Tabari and Ishak Aswad, an ill-natured man, took the field, and Hamza came out to meet him. In the encounter, Hamza cut off Aswad's foot and half his leg. Hamza pursued him and struck a blow, killing Aswad. After this, Utbah took the field and issued a challenge to single combat. Three young Ansar Muslims came forward to meet him. The immigrants had cowered, so Muhammad commanded, Arise, Ubaida, Hamza, and Ali. It was no time before Hamza killed Shaiba, and Ali had killed Walid. Ubaida and Utba each inflicted a blow upon his adversary. Hamza and Ali then turned to Utba with their swords and finished him off. They lifted up their companion Utba to safety. His foot had been cut off, and the marrow was flowing out. When they brought him to Muhammad, Ubaida said, Am I not a martyr, O messenger of Allah? Yes, indeed, the prophet replied. We have our first entrant into Islamic paradise. Can you imagine the surprise on his face when he discovered that it wasn't as Muhammad had described, and that Allah was indeed waiting for him? Tabari. Muhammad turned towards his new quibla and said, Allah, if this band perishes today, you will be worshipped no more. Since Meccan moon gods were in sparse demand, he was probably right. Abu Bakr picked up his cloak and put it on him, grasping him from behind. O oh, prophet, whom I value more than my father and mother, this constant calling on your Lord is annoying. Then Allah revealed, When you sought the help of your Lord, he answered you, saying, I will help you with a thousand angels, rank on rank. This became Quran 8-9. Sure, why not? Allah's angels are so feeble, it takes a thousand of them to do battle with a few hundred intoxicated merchants. Unless we forget, the future caliph found prayer annoying. 
he was there for the booty. Muhammad cried out, Bukhari and Ishak, Here is Gabriel holding the reins of a horse and leading the charge. He is equipped with his weapons and ready for the battle. There is dust on his front teeth. Why was Muhammad's spirit so eager to kill? And why was he a dirty fighter? Bukhari, Gabriel came to the prophet and said, How do you view the warriors of Badar? The prophet said, I see the fighters as the best Muslims. On that, Gabriel said, And so are the angels who are participating in the Badar battle. The best Muslims are warriors, and Allah's best angels are demons. Is this a great religion or what? Tabari, the prophet said when he was in his awning, Allah, keep your contract and your promise. The dark spirit's contract with his prophet traded submission to him for a founder's share of the Kaaba ink. His promise was to make Muhammad rich, powerful, and amply sexed. Bukhari, Abu Bakr took his hand and said, This is enough, prophet. You have tired your lord with your pestering. The next line distinguished Muhammad from the prophets he claimed were his peers. Muhammad was wearing his coat of mail. Armor was something Noah, Abraham, Jonah, Moses, and Yeshua seldom wore. Nor did they say, They will be routed and turn and flee. The hour of doom is their appointed tryst, and it will be more wretched and more bitter than this earthly failure. Quran 54.45 In other words, to hell with them. Thus far, from a religious perspective, the battle of Badar, or full moon, has been a bust. But things were about to change. Dibari. Mihaja, the, the Mala, slave of Umar, the future caliph, was struck by an arrow and killed. He was the first Muslim to die. Mahaja's death must have rattled the militants, because Muhammad was forced to preach a sermon that would make him the prophet of doom. Ishak and Tabari. Allah's messenger went out to his men and incited them to fight. He promised, Every man may keep all the booty he takes. Then Muhammad said, By Allah, if any man fights today and is killed, fighting aggressively, going forward and not retreating, Allah will cause him to enter paradise. They were just words, sound waves that filtered through the air. Yet they have reverberated for fourteen hundred years. They echo still. Umayar, who was holding some dates in his hands and eating them, said, Fine, fine, this is excellent. Nothing stands between me and my entering paradise except to be killed by these people. He threw down the dates, seized his sword, and fought until he was slain. The means behind the madness had finally materialized. Muhammad told his fellow militants that their reward was Allah's paradise. All they had to do to earn their prize was to die murdering others in pursuit of booty. This Muslim militant, this disciple of Muhammad, this misguided youth who had gone off on a terrorist raid to kidnap defenseless civilians and steal their possessions, died shouting these words, Ishak, I am fighting in Allah's service. This is piety and a good deed. In Allah's war I do not fear as others should, for this fighting is righteous, true, and good. Consider the number of times the Quran has spoken of righteous, true, and good deeds. Now you know Allah's definition of piety, and what a good deed actually represents. You also learned Muhammad's definition of a good Muslim. In a way, Muhammad may have been right. If he was speaking on behalf of Satan, not Gabriel, as I suspect, fighting aggressively for booty would have earned a murdering thief direct admission to Satan's paradise. As for Muslim martyrs finding virgins, I wouldn't bet my life on it. But Muslim lives were meaningless to Muhammad, just as Islamic clerics find suicide bombers expendable. In that light, Muhammad issued the Suicide Bomber's Creed. Not for himself, mind you. Ishak and Tabari. O Messenger of Allah, what makes the Lord, that would be Satan, laugh with joy at his servant? 
He replied, when he plunges his hand into the midst of an enemy without armor. So Auf took off the coat of mail he was wearing and threw it away. Then he took his sword and fought the enemy until he was killed. It was the 7th century version of today's boy bombs. While that's clear, I am perplexed by what Mohammed said. It's odd that he didn't need an angelic revelation to know what made Allah laugh with joy. And it sounds as if Allah likes to do the plunging and killing. Further, can you fathom a religion built around a spirit who prefers death to salvation? Then in a tone as demented as the spirit guiding him. Ishak and Tabari Muhammad picked up a handful of pebbles and faced the Quraysh. He shouted, May their faces be deformed! He threw the pebbles at them and ordered his companions to attack. The foe was routed. Allah killed Quraysh chiefs and caused many of their nobles to be taken captive. When the Muslims were taking prisoners, the messenger was in his hut. Whether you are biblically grounded and see Muhammad and his spirit as demonic, or just the personification of evil, there is no way to see them as good. While it's subtle, there's a bit of psychological gamesmanship going on here. Allah was credited with killing and kidnapping. It wasn't Mohammed or his militants. No, they weren't murdering thieves. Their God was. Bukhari. The prophet said, The believers who failed to join the Ghazwa of Badar and those who took part in it are not equal in reward. Muhammad loved murderers. He even loved their weapons. Bukhari. Az-Zubair said, I attack him with my spear and pierced his eye. I put my foot over his body to pull the weapon out, but even then I had to use great force. Later on, Allah's apostle asked me for that spear, and I gave it to him. Show me your treasure, and I will reveal your soul. Ishak and Tabari. As the Muslims were laying their hands on as many prisoners as they could catch, the prophet, I have been told, saw disapproval in the face of Saad. He said, Why are you upset by the taking of captives? Saad replied, This was the first defeat inflicted by Allah on the infidels. Slaughtering the prisoners would have been more pleasing to me than sparing them. Remember these hateful words, and who spoke them. We have not heard the last of Saad. In a long hadith from Abd ar-Rahman, one of the butchers of Nakla, we hear, Ishak and Tabari, Umayyah, a merchant, was a friend of mine in Mecca. My name was Abdamr, but when I became a Muslim, I was called Abd ar-Rahman. This militant was named after the first Islamic god. As such, this is a stinging repudiation of Islam's first pillar. Umayyah used to meet me when we were in Mecca, and would say, Abd Amr, do you dislike the name your father gave you? I would reply, yes. Umayyah would then say, I do not recognize Arachman as a god. So adopt a name that I can call you by when we meet. After some chatter, the friends turned enemies by Islam settled on a name. Well then, you are Abd al-Ilah, slave to the god. I agreed. This line confirms the single most fatal charge that can be leveled against Islam. The Arabic word for God is Ilah, not Allah. Like our Rachman, Allah was the personal name of a rock idol that became one of the Islamic gods. This simple conversation obliterates Muhammad's credibility, the Quran's authority, and Islam's legitimacy. Since our Rachman and Allah are names of gods used throughout the Quran and Hadith, Islam's central claim is bogus. Neither Allah nor Arachman are Yahweh or Yeshua. And since the Islamic duo are incompatible by name and character with Yahweh and Yeshua, all biblical references are just crass plagiarism, inspired by a man's lust for money, sex, and power. The tradition continues, giving us an up-close and personal insight into what Islam did to a man's mind and soul. Fair warning, this isn't pretty. Tabari and Ishak On the day of Badar, I passed Umayyah as he was standing with his son Ali, holding his hand. I had with me some coats of mail, which I had taken as plunder. Umayyah said, Abd al-Illah, would you like to take me as a prisoner? 
I will be more valuable to you as a captive to be ransomed than the coats of mail you are carrying. I said, Yes, come here then. I flung away the armor and bound Umayyah and his son Ali, taking them with me. According to Muhammad and his God, kidnapping for ransom was a legitimate religious practice, one more profitable than stealing armor. And in case you're wondering, the Meccan surrendered because he didn't want the Muslim raiders to kill his son. But it didn't work out that way. People, the Muslim militants, encircled us. Abd al-Rahman and his captives. Then they restrained us physically. One of the Muslims drew his sword and struck Ali in the leg, severing it so that he fell down. Umiyah gave a scream, the like of which I had never heard. I said, Save yourself, for there is no escape for your son. By Allah, I cannot save him from these men. Then the Muslims hacked Ali to pieces. Abd al-Rahman used to say, May Allah have mercy on Bial. A former slave turned Muslim murderer. I lost my coats of mail, and then he deprived me of my captives. In trying to hype the religion of war, the practitioners harpooned it. They not only demoted their gods to pagan status, they exposed their immoral motives. Islam was all about money. And while that should have been enough to impugn the doctrine, the fatal blow was the last paragraph. Muhammad so corrupted these men that they mutilated a child in front of his father, and there was no sense of guilt, no glimmer of humanity. Their only remorse was over lost booty. Islam is an evil curse that must be dispelled. Bukhari The Prophet faced the Kaaba and invoked evil on the Quraysh people, specifically cursing Shaiba, Utba, Walid, and Abu Jal. I bear witness by Allah that I saw them all dead, putrefied by the sun, as Badar was a very hot day. Satan and his demons must have been in paradise. Evil curses were being invoked. People were dying. Bodies were putrefied. And it was hot. Moreover, their favorite prophet was on duty. Bukhari. Allah's apostle raised his head after bowing the first raka of the morning prayer. He said, O oh Allah, curse so-and-so and so-and-so. After he had invoked evil on the Quraysh, Allah revealed, Your Lord will send thousands of angels riding upon chargers, sweeping down as a form of good tidings to reassure you that victory comes from him. He will cut off parts of the unbelievers, overthrow them, and turn them back in frustration. For Allah is forgiving and kind. This became Quran 3, 124. The kind mutilator is telling us Islam is a team affair. Ibn Ishaq says, Also in Tabari, A cousin of mine and I mounted a hill from which we could overlook Badar and see who would be defeated so that we could join in the plundering afterwards. I was pursuing one of the Meccan polytheists in order to smite him when his head suddenly fell off before my sword touched him. Then I knew that someone other than I had killed him. The implication is that one of Allah's angelic brigade did the dastardly deed. My son, I saw Muslims on the day of Badar, and I saw that one of us would wave his sword at a polytheist and the man's head would fall off from his body before the sword touched him. The sign of the angels on the day of Badar was white turbans which trailed down their backs, and on the day of Hunyan it was red turbans. The angels did not fight on any day except the day of Badar, and on other days they were reinforcements, assistants, and helpers, but they struck no blows. It was another Islamic first, killer angels wielding swords. Either way, Islam loses. If there were no angels, then Muhammad and his disciples were liars. If an angelic horde was out chopping off heads of the merchants so that militants could rob them, they were demons. For those familiar with the Bible, you may recall that over the course of 4,000 years, angels caused men to die on only two occasions. Both were in self-defense, and no one got rich. The Egyptians lost their firstborn sons so that the Jewish slaves might be freed, and the Assyrians who were besieging Jerusalem were foiled. Confirming that the Badar terrorist campaign was personal and political, not religious, we read, 
Tabari, and Ishak. When the prophet had finished with his enemy, he gave orders that Abu Jal should be found among the dead. He said, O oh Allah, do not let him escape. The first man who encountered Jal yelled out, and I made him my mark. When he was within my reach, I attacked him and struck him a blow, which severed his foot and half his leg. By Allah, when it flew off, I could only compare it to a date stone which flies out of a crusher when it is struck. Then Jal's son hit me on the shoulder and cut off my arm. It dangled at my side from a piece of skin. The fighting prevented me from reaching him after that. I fought the whole day, dragging my arm behind me. When it began to hurt me, I put my foot on it and stood until I pulled it off. Consider the indoctrination and the motivation required to inspire such devotion and contemplate how the same prophet and doctrine arouse the same hateful passions today, passions capable of toppling economies and nations. Then Mu'adith passed by Abu Jal, who was now crippled and lying helplessly. He hit him until he could no longer move, leaving Jal gasping for his last breath. But then Mu'adich was killed. Abdallah bin Masud passed by Jal right when the messenger ordered us to search for him among the corpses. The prophet said, If you cannot identify him, look for the mark of a wound on his knee, for I jostle against him when we were boys. I pushed him so that he fell and scratched one of his knees. Translated, I may be a cowardly, slithering snake of a man now, but I wasn't always a weasel. Ishak Abdallah bin Musad said, I found Abu Jal in the throes of death. I put my foot on his neck because he had grabbed me once at Mecca and had hurt me. Then I said, Has Allah disgraced you and put you to shame, O enemy of Allah? In what way has he disgraced me, he said? Am I anything more important than a man whom you have killed? Tell me, to whom is the victory? I said, To Allah and his messenger. Bukhari Abu Jal said, You should not be proud that you have killed me. It was the Muslims who had disgraced themselves. A few hundred militants had gone out to rob some merchants, yet God and Prophet declared a glorious victory. Even the pagan Abu Jal knew that it was a meaningless skirmish, an embarrassment for everyone. Ishak and Tubari I cut off Abu Jal's head and brought it to the messenger. I said, O oh, Allah's prophet, this is the head of the enemy of Allah. Muhammad said, Is this so by Allah, than whom there is no other deity? This used to be the messenger of Allah's oath. The vengeful Muhammad was no more articulate than the inspired one. I said, Yes. Then I threw down his head before the prophet's feet. He said, Praise be to Allah. Bukhari O oh, Muslims, take not my enemies as friends, offering them kindness when they reject Allah, the Prophet's Messenger, and his Quran. Whoever does that, then indeed he has gone far astray. You have come out to fight in my cause, seeking my acceptance, so do not be friendly with them even in secret. This was the source of Quran 60, verse 1. It's hard to imagine men writing this down as if they were religious. Ishak Ukasha fought until he broke his sword. He came to the apostle, who gave him a wooden cudgel, telling him to fight with that. He brandished it, and it became a brilliant weapon. Allah gave him victory while he wielded it. He took that weapon with him to every raid he fought with Allah's apostle until he was killed in the rebellion. Which is also known as the War of Compulsion. These were his dying words. What do you think about when you kill people? Are these not men just because they are not Muslims? Sobering, isn't it? According to Ibn Ishaq, Muhammad's quota on paradise was proclaimed at Badar. Ishaq, when Allah's apostle said, Seventy thousand of my followers shall enter paradise like the full moon, Ukasha asked if he could be one of them. Then a lesser Ansari asked to be included, but the prophet replied, Ukasha beat you to it, and my prayer is now cold. At this point in his mission, Muhammad's vision was no greater than the conquest of Mecca and Central Arabia. Inciting 70,000 fools to die for what he coveted seemed sufficient at the time. Little did he know that his scam would live on, infecting billions and sending millions to their death. Second, the... 
like a full moon, was an acknowledgment of Allah's lunar genealogy. Third, to earn Allah's paradise, one has to be a big-time murderer. And fourth, imagine risking your soul on a man who said, My prayer is cold. Both Prophet and God loved it when men sacrificed their lives for them. Bukhari When we wrote the Holy Quran, I missed one of the verses I used to hear Allah's apostle reciting. Then we searched and found it. The verse was, Among the believers are men who have been true to their covenant with Allah. Of them, some have fulfilled their obligations to Allah, that is, they have been killed in Allah's cause, and some of them are still waiting to be killed. This became Surah 33.23. So we wrote this in its place in the Quran. According to the Quran, all good Muslims fall into one of two categories. Those who have died killing infidels, and those who will die killing infidels. The Badar raiders failed as pirates. The caravan they set out to plunder got away. Yet the skirmish that ensued between militants and merchants resurrected a dying doctrine and ultimately reshaped the world. The Islamic lore that emerged that spring morning in 623 from the blood-soaked sands near the eastern shore of the Red Sea serves as the only report of what happened at Badar. Here are some of the most insightful lines spoken that day. The Muslim Abdallah recited this poem. Ishak, it was so criminal men could hardly imagine it. Muhammad was ennobled because of the bloody fighting. I swear we shall never lack soldiers nor army leaders, driving before us infidels until we subdue them with a halter above their noses and a branding iron. We will then drive them to the ends of the earth. We will pursue them on horse and on foot. We will never deviate from fighting in our cause. We will bring upon the infidels the fate of the Ad and Jurum. Any people that disobey Muhammad will pay for it. If you do not surrender to Islam, then you will live to regret it. You will be shamed in hell, forced to wear a garment of molten pitch forever. Second only to the Quran, this may be the nastiest, meanest, most intolerant, violent, and sadistic poem ever recited. Fulfilling prophecy, a Muslim, speaking of the sons of Ishmael, said, Ishak, in peace you are wild asses, rough and coarse, and in war you are like women, wearing corsets. But I care not as long as my hand can grasp my trusty blade. Ishak, a Meccan said, as soon as we were confronted by the raiding party, we turned our backs and they started killing and capturing us at their pleasure. Some of our men turned tail, humiliated. Allah smote some of us with pustules from which we died. Ishak, when the Quraysh began to bewail their dead, consumed in sorrow, one said, Do not do this, for Muhammad and his companions will rejoice over our misfortune. Hamza recited, in Ishak. Surely Badar was one of the world's great wonders. The roads to death are plain to see. Disobedience causes a people to perish. They became death's pawns. We had sought their caravan, nothing else, but they came to us and there was no way out. So we thrust our shafts and swung our swords, severing their heads. Our swords glittered as they killed. The banner of error was held by Satan. He betrayed the evil ones, those prone to treachery. He led them to death, crying, Fear Allah, he is invincible. Satan knew what they could not see. On that day, a thousand spirits were mustered on excited white stallions. Allah's army fought with us. Under our banner, Gabriel attacked and killed them. I agree, Satan was indeed there. Ali recited, Ishak. Have you seen how Allah favored his apostle and how he humiliated the unbelievers? They were put to shame in captivity and death. The apostle's victory was glorious. Its message is plain for all to see. The Lord brought repeated calamities upon the pagans, bringing them under the apostle's power. Allah's angry army smote them with their trusty swords. Many a lusty youngster left the enemy lying prone. Their women wept with burning throats 
for the dead were lying everywhere, but now they are all in hell. It's hard to believe. Violence and pain begat a religion. One of the Meccan merchants said in response, Ishak, I wonder at foolish men like these who sing frivolously and vainly of the slain at Badar. This was nothing more than an impious and odious crime. Men fought against their brothers, fathers, and sons. Any with discernment and understanding recognized the wrong that was done here. al Harath was right. I find his words rational and sobering. They are foreboding. Cobb, a Muslim commander, recited, Ishak, I wonder at Allah's deed. None can defeat him. Evil ever leads to death. We unsheathed our swords and testified to the unity of Allah, and we proved that his apostle brought truth. We smote them, and they scattered. The impious met death. They became fuel for hell. All who aren't Muslims must go there. It will consume them, while the stoker, which I assume is Allah, increases the heat. They had called Allah's apostle a liar. They claimed, you are nothing but a sorcerer. So Allah destroyed them. As you listen to these words, remember this. This day made Islam. On it, Hassan proclaimed, Ishak, they retreated in all directions. They rejected the Quran and called Muhammad a liar. But Allah cursed them to make his religion an apostle victorious. They lay still in death. Their throats were severed. Their foreheads embraced the dust. Their nostrils were defiled with filth. Many a noble, generous man we slew this day. We left them as meat for the hyenas. And later they shall burn in the fires of hell. A terrorist raid designed to loot a caravan had become a noble crusade. These men who had come to protect their property and family were butchered. Their only crime was calling a sorcerer a liar. Pirates and mercenaries fight for booty, not piety. Ubaidah was no exception. Ishak, the battle will tell the world about us. Distant men will heed our warning. The infidels may cut off my leg, yet I am a Muslim. I will exchange my life for one with virgins, fashioned like the most beautiful statues. A Muslim recited these lines. Ishak, their leaders were left prostrate. Their heads were sliced off like melons. Many an adversary have I left on the ground to rise in pain, broken and plucked. When the battle was joined, I dealt them a vicious blow. Their arteries cried aloud, their blood flowed. This is what I did on the day of Badar. At the end of the fighting, Ishak and Tabari, Allah's apostle ordered the dead to be thrown into a pit. All were thrown in except Umayyah. He had swollen up in his coat of mail and filled it. They went to move him, but he fell apart. So they left him where he was and flung some rocks over him. As the dead were being thrown in, Muhammad stood over them and said, O people of the pit, have you found what your Lord promised you to be true? For I have found what my Lord promised me to be true. The Muslims said to him, O Allah's messenger, are you speaking to dead people who have been putrefied? He replied, they know what I promised them is the truth. You hear what I say, no better than they, but they cannot answer me. This is almost as sick as the Islamic God gloating over the new arrivals to hell. It's almost as if Muhammad's warped character rubbed off on Allah. Did I say almost? They became twins. Muhammad was the first prophet to promise his people slaughter rather than salvation. It was the one prophecy he got right. Bukhari. The prophet cursed those that had teased him. He said, O oh Allah, destroy the chiefs of the Quraysh, Abu Jal, Utba, Shaba, Umayyah, and Ubay. I saw these people killed on the day of the Badar battle and thrown into the pit, except Ubay, whose body parts were mutilated. He was putrid, possessed, and pathetic, but not prophetic. While some of this material is redundant, it's important to see how the four prime Islamic sources work together to provide us with a portrait of this man, of his spirit, 
and their religion. Every word devastates Muhammad's character. Every stroke reveals his motives. The Battle of Badar resurrected the fledgling political doctrine of Islam. Yet the motive was greed. The means was terror. The reason was Muhammad. He had come full circle. The abused child was now an empowered, demented, and vicious abuser. This next hadith is telling. The battle over, the booty collected, the ransoms negotiated, it was time for some situational scriptures. Most religions considered murder, piracy, kidnapping, and terrorism bad, so Muhammad needed a special dispensation. As before, I will weave the hadith into the fabric of the Quran to give Allah's scriptures the context of time, circumstance, and place they otherwise lack. Tabari. When the events of Badar were over, Allah revealed the eighth surah, the spoils of war, in its entirety. The two armies met. There were no armies, just merchants and militants. And Allah defeated the Meccans with Muslim swords. Seventy of them were killed, and seventy were taken captive. The previous death toll was forty-four killed, and an equal number brought back for ransom. The lower number is also in line with Ishak's meticulously documented total of fifty dead, and forty-three taken hostage. Abu Bekr said, O Prophet of Allah, these are your people, your family. They are your cousins, fellow clansmen, and nephews. I think that you should accept ransoms for them, so that what we take from them will strengthen us. Yes, it's true. Islam was financed by kidnapping and ransom. The wealth of pagans was forged into the sword of Islam, and Abu Bakr, Muhammad's blood-sucking promoter, was only interested in the money, never religion. Tabari, what do you think of Kitab? Muhammad asked. I say you should hand them over to me so that I can cut off their heads. Hand Hamza's brother over to him so that he can cut off his head. Hand over a quill and a lee so that he can cut off his brother's head. Thus Allah will know that there is no leniency in our heart toward the unbelievers. The messenger liked what Abu Bakr said, and did not like what I said, and accepted ransoms for the captives. Bloodshed was good, money was better. This tradition continues to pull back the veil on Islam. It was a performance one in which a pagan god played the starring role. Tabari, the next day I went to the prophet in the morning. He was sitting with Abu Bakr, and they were weeping. I said, O oh, messenger of Allah, tell me what has made you and your companion weep. If I find to cause to weep, I will weep with you, and if not, I will pretend to weep, because you are weeping. The Prophet said, It is because of the taking of ransoms, which has been laid before your companions. It was laid before me that I should punish them instead. Allah revealed, It is not for any Prophet to have captives until he has made a slaughter in the land. After that, Allah made booty lawful for them. Because money enabled slaughter, Muhammad would have both. Ishak Following Badar, Muhammad sent a number of raiders with orders to capture some of the Meccans and burn them alive. But on the following day, he sent word to us, I told you to burn these men if you got a hold of them, but I decided none has the right to punish by fire save Allah. So if you capture them, kill them. The Hadith report on the Battle of Badar ends with these words. On the Badar expedition, the messenger took the sword of Du al-Fakar as booty. It had belonged to Munabi. On that day also he took Abu Jal's camel as booty. It was a Mahri dromedary on which he used to go on raids. Nothing but the best for Muhammad. After all, he was a prophet. It is said he wrote Ma'akil, which translated means blood money, on his sword. Blood still dripping from the implements of war, the dark spirit of Islam revealed a surah that made killing a religious duty and thievery a sacred right. The Spoils of War, Quran 8, verse 1. They question you about windfalls taken as spoils of war. Say, booty is at the disposal of Allah and the Messenger. 
They belong to us and are for our benefit. So fear Allah and adjust your way of thinking in this matter. Obey Allah and his messenger. How convenient. But this was crass, even for Muhammad. His propensity to steal was obviously being questioned. So he claimed that his God said, The booty is ours. It belongs to us. Some might think that being a pirate would be a great gig if you could get God to sponsor your raids. But for Muhammad that wasn't enough. He was after more than money. He coveted power too. So he had his God say, Obey Allah and the Messenger. Then, for those who were squabbling over the Prophet's new career path, he professed, Adjust your way of thinking and fear me. The communist used to call it re-education, but no matter how you interpret this, it isn't religious, it's disgusting. Muhammad's companions agree with my assessment. Ishak, the spoils of war, Surah, was handed down because we quarreled about the booty. So Allah took it away from us and gave it to his apostle. When he did, we learned to fear Allah and obey his messenger. The hadith goes on to report, For in truth our army had gone out with the prophet seeking the caravan because we wanted its booty. The Quran's attempt at religion were overt efforts to control people through fear, ritual, indoctrination, and taxation. Quran 8 verse 2. The only believers are those who feel fear and terror when Allah is mentioned. When his Quran revelations, like this one focused on killing and stealing, are recited to them because it increases their faith, Muslims establish regular prayers and pay out of the booty we have given them. Muslims who fear will obey, and they will pay. Conditioning men to be submissive through the implementation of religious rituals was good. Motivating them to loot was even better. Quran 8 verse 4 These are true Muslims, for them are exalted grades of honor with their Lord and pardon and a bountiful provision. Who gets the exalted grades of honor, the bountiful provision, you may ask? Muslim militants who leave their homes to rob caravans and murder their kin. That's who. Verse 5. Your Lord ordered and caused you, the good Muslims, out of your homes to fight for the true cause, even though some Muslims disliked it and were averse to fighting. They argued with you concerning this matter of piracy. Even after it was made clear to them, it was as if they were being driven to their death. This verse is speaking of the rift between the good warlike Muslims and the bad, peaceful ones. Good Muslims were ready, willing, and able to plunder and kill, just as they are today. The bad, peaceful Muslims wanted to live and let live. But peace was something Allah couldn't tolerate. Quran 8, verse 7 Behold, Allah promised that one of the two parties would fall and become yours. You, Muhammad, coveted the caravan the one which was not armed. This verse confirms that Muhammad was a pirate, not a general or a prophet. It devastates Islam's credibility, yet it is often missed because the passage goes on to proclaim one of the most fearsome words ever spoken. Allah wished to confirm and justify the truth by his words, wipe the infidels out to the last. The confirmation is clear. It is the justification that's muddled. Muhammad left Medina with his militants for the express purpose of robbing an unarmed caravan. He wanted money. His God wanted war. The dark spirit of Islam wanted to slaughter and humiliate all of those who did not bow to his authority. Satan enticed men to do his bidding. His goal was to cloud men's minds so that they would no longer recognize the truth. Quran 8, verse 8, that he might justify truth and prove falsehood false, distasteful though it be to the disbelievers who oppose. The writing quality is dreadful, so let me translate this for you. The verse says, the people whose consciences had not yet been eroded opposed terror. That made them guilty. From Satan's perspective, truth could only be justified by killing men with a conscience, 
men with the ability to discern right from wrong. You are witnessing spiritual warfare of the highest order, and the stakes in this game are men's souls. Muhammad made a deal with the devil. Quran 8 verse 9 Remember, you implored the assistance of your Lord, and he heard what you requested. I will assist you with one thousand angels, ranks on ranks. If ever a verse proved that the Quran was as false as its deity, this is it. It is beyond comprehension that the creator of the universe would send his angels to help a pirate. Moreover, can you imagine angels so impotent it takes one thousand of them to kill fifty merchants? There is more to this demonic assistance than I have shared thus far. According to the Hadith and Quran, Allah used rain and wind to foil the merchants. Rain was said to have secured the gravel under the militants and undermined the sandy slopes beneath the merchants' feet, and a wind from behind the militants' backs blew coarse sand in the merchants' faces, impairing their vision. The Bible calls Satan the prince and power of the air. He was given control over weather. In the book of Job, Satan uses wind and a thunderstorm to try and lure a man of God away from the truth. He also incites men to kill and steal on his behalf. That is precisely what happened at Badar, and for the same reasons. Is it a coincidence or not? The Hadith and Quran reveal something more sinister than just a bad man who craved power, sex, and money. To understand what was at stake, we need to expose the spirit that inspired Islam. And to accomplish this, we must turn to the same place Muhammad turned for enlightenment, the Hebrew Bible. By lifting the majority of the Quran from its pages, he left the honest searcher with no option but to compare where they agree and conflict. And what we find is that the spirit of Islam is identical to the fallen angel, Halal bin Shakar, or Satan. Allah's nature, character, motivations, means, and limitations are a carbon copy of the devil's. He deceives men and leads them astray. He enjoys torment, killing, and death. He entices lost souls. And for the purpose of this book, it matters not if you view the Bible as inspired or Satan as real. If you do, you will see Allah more clearly and understand the significance of the problem currently facing the world. If not, it's sufficient that you see Muhammad's words and behaviors as deceitful, as demented. Either way, the greatest service we can render Muslims is to free them from Islam. In so doing... We will free ourselves from the terror this man, his spirit, and doctrine inspire. Reading on, we discover that Muhammad was no better at piracy than he was at prophecy. Quran 8, verse 10. Allah made the victory. Killing, kidnapping, and stealing. But a message of hope, a glad tiding to reassure you. Victory of this kind comes only from Allah. Actually, Satan... Lo, Allah is almighty. Remember, he has covered you with slumber. As a security from him, he sent down rain to clean you of the plague of evil suggestions of Satan, that you might plant your feet firmly. Satan's plague was being cast out of heaven for disobedience. His curse is to bring mankind down to his level. A hadith says, Ishak. Allah sent down water from the sky at night, and it prevented the polytheists from getting to the well before us. This tradition is followed by a hellish one, suggesting the source of the inclement nocturnal weather. Ishak, I will cast terror into the hearts of those who reject me, so strike off their heads and cut off their fingers. All who oppose me and my prophet shall be punished severely. Then from the Quran. Quran 8, verse 12. Your Lord inspired the angels, actually fellow demons, with the message, I am with you. Go and give firmness to the believers. I will terrorize the unbelievers. Therefore smite them on their necks and every joint and incapacitate them. Strike off their heads and cut off each of their fingers and toes. Allah is calling himself a terrorist. He is ordering his fellow demons to decapitate and mutilate men so that their fathers, sons, and brothers might rob them. 
Islam has sunk to a new low. Ah, but it was justified according to the spirit of Islam. Quran 8 verse 13. This because they rejected Allah. The Meccans invented Allah. They never rejected him. So this was all about. And defied his messenger. If anyone opposes Allah and his messenger, Allah shall be severe in punishment. This is the torment. So taste the punishment. For those infidels who resist, there is the torment of hell. Well, Allah's command to fight is new, as is his bribe of booty. His character hasn't changed. He's the same old demented fellow we grew to despise in Mecca. Surrender and obey, or you will die. Quran 8, verse 15. Believers, these would be Muslims, when you meet unbelieving infidels in battle while you are marching for war, never turn your backs on them. If any turns his back on such a day, unless it be in a stratagem of war, a maneuver to rally his side, he draws on himself the wrath of Allah, and his abode is hell, an evil refuge. This is like the pseudo-religious Teutonic Oath of the Nazi SS. It's identical to the mindset of the kamikaze divined wind. Not only are Muslims ordered to attack, they are condemned if they retreat. Islam is a fight to the death. And lest we forget, Allah hates peaceful Muslims. If you know one, you ought to share this verse with them. They could do better than follow a God who hates them for doing the right thing. The following verse is one of many that is meaningless outside of the context the Hadith provides. As you recall, Muslims claim that Allah's angels severed men's heads before their swords reached them. And we learn, Ishak, Allah said concerning the pebbles thrown by the apostle, I threw them not at you. Your tossing them would have had no effect without my help. But working together we terrorized the enemy and put them to flight. In that context, I present the Quran. Quran 8, verse 17. It is not you, Muhammad and Muslims, who slew them. It was Allah who killed them. It was not you, Muhammad, who threw a handful of dust. It was not your act, but it was Allah who threw the sand in the eyes of the enemy at Badar, in order that he might test the Muslim believers by doing them a gracious favor of his own. For Allah is he who hears and knows. By adding words inside parentheses, the Islamic scholars who translated the Quran have admitted two things. The Quran is senseless without the Sirah and the Sirah is scripture. Furthermore, the passage is worse in context, not better. Allah is confessing to a crime. The men that he claimed he killed were neither warriors nor criminals. They were businessmen trying to keep Muslims from stealing their wares. By any sane definition, when he pursued and killed these men, he committed an act of first-degree murder, a capital offense. In all civilized societies... Murderers are either put to death or separated for life. Shouldn't Allah receive the same sentence? And is often the case, the murdering spirit is insane. He said that his rage was a gracious favor. Why would Allah confess to such heinous crimes, and why did he elect to gloat about his outing with the pirates? The reasons are threefold. First, Satan had done all he could. He had manipulated the weather and induced men to behave badly. He was proud of himself, the very feeling that got him into trouble in the first place. Second, Muhammad was a coward in battle. He hunkered down in his palm frond hut, a safe distance behind the battle lines. He needed to revise history so that his militants would believe that by tossing pebbles he was actually fighting with God. Third, Muhammad took 20% of the spoils, a hundred times larger share than any of the combatants. If Allah was the most vicious and prolific killer, rather than the pirates, he deserved the largest share. Quran 8, verse 18. This and surely, Allah weakens the deceitful plots of unbelieving infidels. In order to justify this excrement, Muhammad and Allah had to stupefy their militants first. 
Good must be made to appear bad, and bad must become good. The unbelieving infidels were at Badar to defend their people and protect their property from the bad Muslims. Yet this good motive is twisted into a deceitful plot. It's but another Quranic lie. Quran 8 verse 19. Quraysh unbelievers, you asked for a judgment, so that judgment came to you. If you desist, it will be best for you. If you return to the attack, so shall we. And your forces, no matter how large, will fail. For verily Allah is with those who believe him. Unable to deliver the threatened day of doom, Allah is suggesting that this sandlot skirmish is its equivalent. It is also interesting that the Spirit's judgment renders booty to criminals. Further, the defensive tactics of the merchants were wrongly twisted into looking like an attack by the delusional spirit. Yet the Meccans were merely safeguarding their wares. The Muslims were on the prowl trying to steal them. This convoluted reasoning is the same strategy modern Muslims voiced on an ignorant media. Thus, when the Israelis defend themselves from Islamic terror, they are recast as the aggressors. With situational scriptures issued and history twisted, it was time to reinforce the purpose of Islam. Quran 8 verse 20 O you who believe, obey Allah and His Messenger. Do not turn away from Him when you hear Him speak. Do not be like those who say, We hear, but do not listen. Those who do not obey are the worst of beasts, the vilest of animals in the sight of Allah. They are deaf and dumb. Those who do not understand are senseless. If Allah had seen any good in them, He would have made them listen. And if He had made them listen, they would but have turned away and declined submission. When you consider the audience and the circumstances, this is transparent. Muhammad was lashing out at the good people of Medina, calling them bad Muslims for not following his orders to fight. The bad Muslims still knew right from wrong. Their consciences told them that piracy, terrorism, murder, kidnapping, ransom, and thievery were evil. As such, they were good people. When the Prophet spoke to them, commanding them to become pirates, they turned away and did not listen to him. The good Muslims, however, like their counterparts today, had been corrupted by Islam. They could no longer distinguish between right and wrong, so they zealously followed their profiteer on raids to pillage and plunder. While it is obvious that this demented doctrine needs to be exposed and exterminated, sentenced to die for its crimes, bad Muslims should be leading the parade. Their foe deity just called them the vilest of creatures. Yes, any Muslim who does not follow Muhammad's orders to murder infidels, to pillage and plunder them, is deaf and dumb, senseless, the worst of beasts. Allah hates, above all else, peace-loving Muslims, even more than he hates Jews. I beg any Muslim listening to these words to let them sink in. Your God condemns you if you do not lash out in jihad, if you do not fight to the death for this demented cause. If the Quran is true, if Allah is God, if Muhammad was a prophet, and you are a peaceful, loving Muslim, you are destined for a hell even more torturous than that prepared for the hospitality of the infidels. It's a lose-lose game with your soul at stake. If Islam is true, you're toast. If Islam is a lie, you live in the poverty of a delusional doctrine and will spend your eternity separated from Yahweh, your Creator. It doesn't have to be that way. Before we leave this stunning indictment of Islam, I'd like to address the opening salvo of the 20th verse. Muhammad said that any time he speaks, he must be believed, followed, and obeyed. Not Allah, him. Even Ishak agrees. Allah said, Do not turn away from Muhammad when he is speaking to you. Do not contradict his orders, and do not be a hypocrite, one who pretends to be obedient to him, and then disobeys him. 
Those who do so will receive my vengeance. You must respond to the apostle when he summons you to war. Technically, one cannot be a bad Muslim. A peaceful, loving person is either a non-Muslim or a hypocrite. Therefore, all true Muslims obey Muhammad's dictates, making them bad people. Muhammad's summons was to raid civilians and steal their property. This wasn't holy war. It was terrorism. Also, to follow Muhammad's orders, as Allah is compelling, one must understand the Sunnah and comply with its hadith. That is the only place the Prophet's commands and terrorist example can be found. That is, unless you see Muhammad as Allah, and in that case, the Quran is just a redundant sunnah. Either way, from this point forward, Islam is a terrorist manifesto. Its creed is, Obey Muhammad, Fight for Muhammad, and Pay Muhammad. Since the last Quranic pronouncement was too transparent even for Islam's prophet, the megalomaniac stepped aside momentarily and placed himself back on equal footing with his God. Quran 8 verse 24 O believers, answer Allah and his messenger when he calls you to that which will give you life. Martyrdom. And know that Allah comes in between a man and his heart. To him you shall be gathered. Fear the affliction and trial that awaits those who do not obey. Allah is severe. Yes, all Muslims will meet Allah, the demonic spirit of Islam. Their affliction at his hands will be severe. Ever deceitful, Muhammad and Allah are calling Muslims to fight to the death for their benefit. Yet they say that they are being called to life. This reminds me of Satan's temptation in the garden. The apple represented death, and yet Satan called that choice immortality, life. Quran 8, verse 26. And remember, when you were a small band of bandits, and reckoned feeble and despised in the land, and were afraid that men might despoil and kidnap you, carrying you off by force, how he provided a safe asylum for you, strengthened you with his aid. He gave you refuge and gave you the good stolen things that haply you might be thankful. Oh, that you believe. Don't betray Allah and the messenger, nor misappropriate things entrusted to you. Gloating is unseemly. Mohammed's militants had won a skirmish against some poorly equipped and out of shape businessmen. The Muslims were but a small band of bandits, feeble and despised before Badar. They remained so after the battle. No Muslim was carried off by force. They were the kidnappers. As for an asylum, I'd be happy to recommend one. Quran 8 verse 28 And know that your property and your children are just a temptation and that Allah has the best rewards. The idea that children are just a temptation is telling. Is Muhammad suggesting that men might be tempted to abuse their sons as he himself was abused as a child? Or is he asking parents to sacrifice their children and their money on jihad's altar, as so many Muslims do today? While perverse, neither is as twisted as the notions of God's best reward is an inebriated stay in his whorehouse. Nor are they any more evil than an Islamic imam seducing mercenary militants to murder innocents to gain entry. Quran 8 verse 29 O you who believe, if you obey and fear Allah, He will grant you a criterion to judge between right and wrong, or a way to overlook your evil thoughts and deeds. If you are a good Muslim and obey out of fear, Allah will grant you a new criterion to judge between right and wrong. And that's because all other religions, moral codes, and societal mores define piracy, murder, plunder, terrorism, kidnapping, thievery, and ransom as evil. But not to worry, O oh, Islamic terrorist, because Allah will forgive you of your crimes, corrode your mind, and rid you of the pangs of conscience. Quran 8 verse 30 
Remember how the unbelievers, Meccan merchants, plotted against you, O Muhammad, to keep you in bonds, or slay you, or get you out of your home. They plotted, and Allah, too, had arranged a plot. But Allah is the best schemer. Because you have read the Hadith and studied the Quran in context, you know that Muhammad claimed he received this verse two years earlier. And you know that the kidnappers and the slayers were Muslims. As for Allah being the best plotter, a world-class schemer, I couldn't agree more. He is the best in the world at what he does. Prince Charming says, Ishak. I am the best of plotters. I deceived them with my guile, so that I delivered you from them. Webster defines guile the same way the Bible defines Satan. Insidious and cunning, a crafty or artful deception. Duplicity. Quran 8, verse 31. When our verses are rehearsed to them, they say, We have heard this before. In other words, this is plagiarized. If we wished, we could say words like these. These are nothing but stories of the ancients. The reason the local Arab population, Yathrib, was questioning the Prophet's credentials was that he had already trotted out the second surah. It was filled with convoluted stories lifted from the pages of the Torah. This verse confirms that bad Muslims were smart enough to recognize a false prophet. In the next passage we find Muhammad sidestepping the no miracles, no prophet, and no signs, no God criticisms. It's as feeble as ever. Quran 8.32 Remember how they said, O Allah, if this Quran is indeed the truth revealed from you, rain down on us a shower of stones from the sky, or send us a painful doom. But Allah was not going to send them a penalty while you, Muhammad, were among them. But what plea have they that Allah should not punish them? What makes them so special? They obstructed men from the holy mosque, though they were not its fitting and appointed guardians. Its custodian can only be the one who keeps his duty to Allah. Their prayer and worship at the house of Allah, the Kaaba, is nothing but whistling and clapping of hands. They will have to taste the punishment because they disbelieved. This passage says that pagans believed Allah was God. They prayed to him and worshipped at his house. As such, it destroys Muhammad's justification for killing them. These verses also contain lies and a confession. The Meccans never restricted access to the mosque. The Kaaba was the centerpiece of Kusay's religious scam. It was their meal ticket. The more pilgrims, the better. It was Muhammad and his Muslims who were intolerant. They would ultimately restrict access, prohibiting all non-Muslims from entering Mecca. The confession provides additional support for the profitable prophet plan. Muhammad was claiming ownership of the Kaaba Inc. because he deemed himself more deserving than the rightful owners. He had made a deal with the devil. Custodianship of the Kaaba, of Allah's house, was to be his reward. Quran 8, verse 36. The unbelievers spend their wealth to hinder man from the way of Allah, and so they will continue to spend, but in the end they will have intense regrets and sighs. It will become an anguish for them, and they will be subdued. The unbelievers shall be driven into hell, in order that Allah may distinguish the bad from the good and separate them. Allah wants to heap the wicked one over the other and cast them into hell. They are the losers. The Meccan merchants had promoted the way of Allah. Allah's house was all the Quraysh had going for them. But that lie isn't the problem with this verse. Muhammad, on behalf of his spirit, is telling non-Muslims that anguish awaits them, that they will be subdued, forced into submission, and then driven into hell. Terror, a living hell, is the legacy of Muhammad. Even Ishak sees Allah as demented. Allah said, Leave me to deal with the liars. I have fetters and fire and food which chokes. I will smote the Quraysh at Badar. The hateful and violent message of the Quran is clear. 
It's as clear as mein Kampf. Quran 8, verse 39. So fight them until there is no more fitna, or disbelief. Non-Muslims, in other words. And all submit to the religion of Allah alone in the world. But if they cease, Allah is seer of what they do. In or out of context, this is unequivocal. The Islamic war machine must continue to roll until every soul on earth submits to the religion of Allah. There will be no exceptions, no understandings, no appeasements, no compromises, no treaties. It is surrender or die. And this verse cannot be misinterpreted, corrupted or dismissed. The order is clear. Fight until the whole world is in submission to Islam. But should you want confirmation, Ishak, the first imam to record the message of fundamental Islam, interprets the verse this way. He said, fight them so that there is no more rebellion, and religion, all of it, is for Allah only. Allah must have no rivals. This verse should be hung in every church, in every synagogue, in every school, in every state house. It ought to be plastered in the front door of the State Department, the Pentagon, the Capitol, and the White House. Incidentally, there are two wars being announced here, not one. The first is religious. The second is spiritual. Submission to the religion of Islam is entirely political, a war designed to suppress and to plunder. That battle is being fought with swords, guns, and bombs. It destroys physical things, including the flesh. The spiritual war is being waged for souls. Allah, as Satan, will not tolerate a rival. Allah u Akbar, Allah is greater, is the battle cry of this war. Satan wants us to worship him. Islam is simply his most effective and deadly scheme. Unfortunately, the Quran's dark spirit knew how to motivate a merciless band of religious fanatics. Ishak, Allah taught them how to divide the spoil. He made it lawful and said, A fifth of the booty belongs to the apostle. This is confirmed in the surah. Quran 8 verse 40. If people are obstinate and refuse to surrender, know that Allah is your supporter, and know that one-fifth of all the booty you take belongs to Allah, and to the messenger, and for the near relatives of the messenger, orphans, and the needy wayfarer. We've heard this before. Believe in Allah, and in what we sent down to our slave on the day of victory over the infidels when the two armies clashed, and Allah has the power to do all things. Fortunately, all Allah slash Satan can do is play with the weather and tempt men to do his bidding. Unfortunately, all too many are willing. The temptation in this case was money. Muslim militants got rich, at least by Arab standards, robbing Muhammad's enemies. Of course, they had to give the prophet a fifth of the spoil. Yet that was no more onerous than what Blackbeard required. Since Badar was only a ragtag mob of mercenary misfits against a bunch of camel-driving merchants, you have to wonder about the inadequacy of a spirit who called them armies and required a thousand demonic angels to carry the day. I wouldn't bet my life on Team Islam. You may have picked up on it already, but if not, Mohammed had a little problem. He and his raiders had gone after the merchandise-laden caravan. The money they sought eluded them. So while they stole some swords and coats of mail, and kidnapped some men for ransom, the expedition was a bust. The caravan got away. Quran 8.42 Remember, you were on the hither side of the valley, and they were on the yonder bank. The caravan was on lower ground still, by the coast. Even if you had made a mutual appointment to meet, you would certainly have declined to fight and failed to achieve your goal, because Allah needed to accomplish a different matter. Those who were destroyed had to perish as a clear demonstration of Allah's seductive control. 
and those who lived survived as positive proof of his authority. Allah is he who hears and knows. In other words, Allah won the coin toss. His lust for murder took precedence over Muhammad's yearning for money. As for the dark spirit of Islam hearing and knowing, that's true. Satan is able to maneuver in time and to travel unseen. He listens and learns how to best tempt his stooges. Everyone has a soft spot, a longing, a desire, something that they crave. Quran 8.45 O believers, when you meet an army, be firm and think of Allah's name much, that you may prosper. It was a hellish bargain they had made for money. Obey Allah and His Messenger, and do not dispute with them. Lest you lose courage and your power departs, persevere. The Hadith says, Ishaq, Muslims fight in Allah's cause. Stand firm and you will prosper. Help the Prophet, obey him, give him your allegiance, and your religion will be victorious. Had joined the party, so the bad Muslims had to be rebuked. There was no room in Islam for a second leader or for peace. Quran 8.47 Be not as those who came from their homes full of their own importance, trying to turn men away from fighting in Allah's cause. Allah is encircling them. Satan made their acts seem alluring to them and said, No one can conquer you this day while I am near you. But when the two armies came in sight of each other, he turned on his heels and said, Lo, I am not with you. I see what you cannot. Verily, I fear Allah, for Allah is severe in punishment. Ishak tells us, Umair saw Satan at Badar. When the devil turned, a surah was handed down concerning him. Then describing Allah, Umar says, Ishak, Satan made their deeds seem good to them, and said they would be victorious because he was their protector, but the devil deceived them. And he continues to do so. Following the satanic interlude, Allah caused bad Muslims diseased. Their peaceful nature evidently irked the spirit of war. Quran 8.49 The hypocrites, bad Muslims, and those in whose heart is a disease, said, The religion has deceived and misled them. Bad Muslims could be good people, discerning people. They recognized that fundamental Islam was deceitful. They knew Islam, Muhammad, and Allah better than anyone. If this is God speaking, I move we elect a new one. Verse 50 If you could have seen the infidels when the angels drew away their souls, striking their faces and smiting their backs, the angels said, Taste the penalty of the blazing fire. Verse 52 They, the Meccans, brought this upon themselves. Their case is like that of Pharaoh and those before them. They denied and rejected the revelations of Allah, and Allah destroyed them, punishing them for their crimes, for Allah is strict, severe in punishment. And what Bear is saying, Bear is repeating. Verse 54. This was the case with Pharaoh and those before them. They denied and rejected the revelations of their Lord, so we destroyed them. This wasn't a second translation. It was just a senior moment. The war, Surah, marches on with these lovely words. Quran 8, verse 55. Verily, the worst of creatures, the vilest of beasts in the sight of Allah, are those who reject Him and will not believe. They are those with whom you make an agreement, but they break their covenant every time, and they keep not their duty to fight. The bad Muslims are being hammered again. Muhammad is miffed that they reneged on the pledge of Aqaba. Muslims agreed to protect the Prophet, like they did their women, and to fight whomever he fought. They didn't figure on that including terrorism and piracy, so they bailed on him. As a consequence, the bad, peace-loving Muslims were labeled the worst of creatures. Enough, Mr. Nice Guy. It was time to go back on the warpath. These are some of the most chilling words ever uttered in the name of God. Quran 8.57 if you gain mastery over them in battle, inflict such a defeat as would 
terrorize them so that they would learn a lesson and be warned. It's pretty hard to reconcile these words with the Islam is a peace-loving religion myth. This sounds like one of Al-Qaeda's speeches to me. The Sira presents the terrorist manifesto this way. Ishak, if you come upon them, deal with them so forcibly as to terrify those who would follow them so that they may be warned. Make a severe example of them by terrorizing Allah's enemies. Before anyone puts their trust in the peace process or supports a treaty with Islamic organizations or nations, they should consider Allah's admonition. Quran 8.58 If you apprehend treachery from any group on the part of a people with whom you have a treaty, retaliate by breaking off relations with them, for Allah loves not the treacherous. The infidels should not think that they can bypass the law of the punishment of Allah. Surely they cannot get away. A second translation reads, The unbelieving infidels should not think that they can bypass Islam. Surely they cannot escape. Now that Islam has our undivided attention, it's time for Allah to scare us to death. Quran 8 verse 60 Prepare against them whatever arms and cavalry you can muster, that you may strike terror in the enemies of Allah, and others beside them not known to you. This is a call for all good Muslims to amass their weapons of mass destruction. The noble Quran even adds, Tanks, planes, missiles, and artillery. To the text, Allah is ordering Muslims to terrorize his enemy, their enemies, and enemies yet unknown. This is as purposeful as a panzer tank, as unyielding as a kamikaze. It explains why Muslims are terrorists, and it foretells our future if we fail to expose this doctrine, if we fail to annihilate it before it annihilates us. This is a matter of life and death. So I want to give you the benefit of another translation. Against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war, to strike terror into the enemies of Allah and your enemies, and others besides whom you may not know. Whatever you spend in Allah's cause will be repaid in full, and no wrong will be done to you. For killing others. If you were ignorant of verses 57 through 60, you might be succored by the 61st. Quran 8, verse 61. But if the enemy inclines toward peace, do you also incline to peace and trust in Allah? However, should they intend to deceive or cheat you, verily Allah suffices. He strengthened you with his aid and with the believers. The small print here is real important. Should they intend to deceive or cheat? Is an open invitation to invoke Quran 8:57 to 60. It presupposes a hypothetical before anything occurs, and Muhammad knew it. Within days, he would claim that he feared the Jewish Quanuka. He broke the treaty he had formed with them, besieged them, exiled them, and stole their homes, property, and businesses. The first man to interpret this surah said, Ishak, if they ask you for peace on the basis of Islam or submission, make peace on that basis. Be of one mind by his religion. The next two verses, which speak of cementing love in the midst of a killing spree, are incomprehensible. This odd segue brings us to one of Allah's most ominous lines. Quran 8.65 O Prophet, urge the believers to fight. If there are twenty among you with determination, they will vanquish two hundred. If a hundred, they will slaughter a thousand of the unbelieving infidels, for these are a people devoid of understanding. This is the math of terror. On September 11th, Nineteen good Muslims followed Allah's instructions and murdered three thousand innocent men, women and children, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. They snuffed out their lives because we are a people devoid of understanding. I know that the temptation is to read on, but please, before you do, ponder the implications of this surah. 
This is the spirit of Islam speaking directly to Muslims. It is why they are terrorists. The Sira proclaims, Ishak, O Prophet, exhort the believers to fight. If there are twenty good fighters, they will defeat two hundred, for they are a senseless people. They do not fight with good intentions, nor for truth. Such could be said for America. The U.S. State Department has managed to lose the peace because they are ignorant of the truth. Believing that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, we fight with less than ideal intentions. As a nation, we have partnered with the wrong people and thereby created our next foe. We liberated China and they slaughtered us in Korea. We supported Stalin and it killed us in Vietnam. We funded the Mujahideen and they became Al Qaeda. We furnished biological weapons to Saddam Hussein, and Americans died to keep him from using them. Not to be outdone, we have formed alliances with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Syria against Israel, so that our friend might be victimized. Allah wasn't finished motivating his terrorists to attack. Quran 8:66. Now Allah has lightened your task, for He knows that there is a weak spot in you. Which is precisely what he is exploiting. So, if there are a hundred of you with determination, they will vanquish two hundred, and if a thousand, they will kill two thousand by the will of Allah. For Allah is with those who are determined. It's true. Letters taken from the cars the suicide bombers of 9/11 left behind included prayers to Allah. The Muslims were singing Allah u Akbar. As they slit the stewardesses' throats and pointed the planes at our buildings, this is the price we pay for our blindness, for seeing Islam as a religion rather than a terrorist dogma. We allow mosques to preach the hatred and violence of the Eighth Surah right next door to our businesses, our schools, and our homes. The crater that was the World Trade Center stands as a memorial to our ignorance. The destruction of New York will be the legacy of our inaction. Ishak, Abdallah told me that when this verse came down, it was a shock to the Muslims who took it hard. They were afraid, as the odds were too great. So Allah relieved them and canceled the verse with another. Now has Allah relieved you, and He knows that there is a weakness among you. So if there are one hundred, rather than twenty. They shall vanquish two hundred. Now that he had calmed the nerves of his squeamish militants, the war god of Islam was ready to approve kidnapping for ransom. He knew that terrorists craved money as much as they enjoyed murder. Quran 8:67. It is not fitting for any prophet to have prisoners until he has made a great slaughter in the land. You desire the lure of frail goods of this world, while Allah desires the hereafter, and Allah is mighty. Another translation reads: No apostle should take captives until he has battled and subdued a nation. This is a dual confession. Muhammad lusted for the ransom captives would bring, but his Allah persona was unwilling to enrich the prophet until he became a psychopathic killer. That's because Allah was entertained by torturing men in the fires of hell. And if you're unsure whether calling Muhammad a psychopath is fair, go back and read his conversation with the mutilated bodies in the pit. Every word of this is so unbelievable, so maniacal. I have tried to buttress the Quranic presentation with an ample dose of Ishak's insights. Allah said, "No prophet before Muhammad took booty from his enemy, nor prisoners for ransom." Muhammad said, "I was made victorious with terror. The earth was made a place for me to clean. I was given the most powerful words. Booty was made lawful for me. I was given power to intercede. These five privileges were awarded to no prophet before me." There is no dying that Muhammad was unlike all other prophets. The Sira continues to interpret the Quran. Ishak, Allah said, a prophet must slaughter before collecting captives. A slaughtered enemy is driven from the land. Muhammad, you craved the desires of this world, its goods, and the ransom captives would bring, but Allah desires killing them. 
to manifest the religion. This is so ungodly, so demonic, I don't even know what to say. Allah desires killing them to manifest the religion. Quran 8, verse 68. Had it not been for a previous agreement from Allah, a severe penalty would have reached you for the ransom that you took as booty. In other words, the Prophet was given a special dispensation. Since he had shown himself worthy and been willing to slaughter his kin, ransom was his just reward. Imagine that. But since you're my boy, revel in the loot, celebrate the butchering of your kin, turn your murderers into martyrs. Quran 8, verse 69. So enjoy what you took as booty. The spoils are lawful and good. Once again, this is demonic. Satan is the only spirit capable of not only authorizing thievery, but actually calling it good. And it was good from his perspective, because it seduced men to act badly. The Hadith agrees. Ishak. Allah made booty lawful and good. He used it to incite the Muslims to unity of purpose. So enjoy what you have captured. The following is hideously out of character for the author of this surah. As such, it's part of the deception. Fear Allah, for Allah is forgiving, merciful. Quran 8, verse 70. O prophet, tell the captives in your hands, if Allah knows or finds any good in you, he will give you something better than what has been taken from you. What is the black stone supposed to do when it finds something good? Roll over, jump for joy? And by the way, why do the captives who lost their sons and brothers trying to protect their belongings need forgiveness? They were victims, not villains. But that wasn't the purpose of this verse. It was designed to lure Meccans into Muhammad's service. If they joined him, they too would be able to steal and kidnap, all with God's blessing. Only the illiterate messenger of a rock idol would recite something this foolish. Quran 8.71 If they try to deceive you, remember that they have deceived Allah before. So he gave you mastery over them. Fortunately, Allah is dumb enough to be deceived by man. We can prevail against Satan and his Islam. But first, we must break the curse. We must free Muslims to think for themselves, for until we do, they will continue to pit good Muslims against bad Muslims. Quran 8.72 Those who accepted Islam left their homes and fought with their property and lives in Allah's cause, as well as those who gave them asylum, aid, and shelter, those who harbored them. These are the allies of one another. According to Allah, a good Muslim kills and aids or abets killers. That explains the Taliban. What's more, a good Muslim is a suicide bomber. They sacrifice their life and property in Allah's cause. To define bad Muslims, the verse says, You are not responsible for protecting those who embraced Islam, but did not leave their homes to fight until they do so. And so there would be no doubt Muhammad once again helped his God characterize the nature and deeds of good Muslims. Quran 8.73 The unbelieving infidels are allies, unless you... The translators of the Quran added, Muslims of the world, unite and... Aid each other. The translators again added, fighting as allies, as one united block under one caliph to make Allah's religion victorious. There will be confusion, anarchy, and discord on earth, great mischief and corruption. These good Muslims who accepted Islam left their homes to fight in Allah's cause. The translators added within the Quranic text, Al-Jihad. As well as those who give them asylum, shelter, and aid, these are all good Muslims, believers. For them is pardon and bountiful provision in paradise. By definition, all good Muslims are bad people. Islam makes them that way. We have seen Islam in action. God and Prophet have revealed their true identities, their motives, and their rage. 
there is no retreat from the battlefields of Badar, as with the Nazis documenting their barbaric behavior in Poland. Islam chronicled its deeds. The doctrine cannot escape the damage that it did to itself in the month of Ramadan, A.H. 2, March 624 A.D. The books of Ishak, Tabari, Bukhari, Muslim, and Allah agree. The verdict is unanimous. Islam is a violent and inept political doctrine, not a religion. Its founder was a pirate, not a prophet. We know this because they told us. I'd like to leave Badar by sharing some hadith that expose the nature of the egotistical monster Muhammad had become. Bukhari The Prophet got a silver ring made with Muhammad Allah's Apostle engraved on it. The ring glittered on his hand. Bukhari Allah's Apostle said, I have five names. I am Muhammad and Ahmad, the praised one. I am Al-Mahi, through whom Allah will eliminate infidelity by killing every infidel. I am Al-Hashir, who will be the first to be resurrected, meeting Yeshua. And I am also Al-Aqib, because there will be no prophet after me. Muhammad succeeded in Medina because the heathen Arabs were led to believe that he was the Messiah a title this prophet was all too willing to accept. Bukhari, I heard Allah's apostle saying, I am the nearest of all the people to Isa, which they translate Jesus. All of the prophets are paternal brothers. Their mothers are different, but their religion is one. There has been no prophet between me and Isa. No behavior in human history, no message in all of time, was more counter to Yeshua's than that which flowed from this ignorant and immoral beast. And this scripture we have been reading was Muhammad's lone miracle. Bukhari, Allah's apostle said every prophet was given miracles because of which people believed, but what I have been given is divine inspiration, which Allah has revealed to me, so I hope that my followers will outnumber the followers of the other prophets. But even he had a low regard for his divine inspiration. Bukhari The prophet preached at a suitable time so that we might not get bored. He abstained from pestering us with sermons and knowledge. That's because Islam was a scam. It was neither enlightenment nor religion. It was about a man. Bukhari, Allah's apostle said, Whoever obeys me will enter paradise, and whoever disobeys me will not enter it. Muhammad and Islam were poison. This is what happened to those who were exposed. Bukhari, Ali burnt some former Muslims alive. And this news reached Ibn Abbas, who said, Had I been in his place, I would not have burnt them, as the prophet said, Don't punish anybody with Allah's punishment. No doubt I would have killed them, for the prophet said, If a Muslim discards his Islamic religion, kill him. So now you know who the enemy really is. You know why they kill. You know that the civilized world will continue to be terrorized as long as we tolerate Islam. It will continue to destroy men's souls, seducing them to murder and mayhem. Only one question remains. What will you do about it? (laughs) 